Hi, good afternoon. I'm still taking notes. I still like to, to take notes. Um, so uh, today I'm going to actually share a little bit of my own work, and I'd like to uh, start off by saying that both Karen's work and, and George's work um, help frame um, part of what I'm talking about today, but also my own project. As an artist, educator, and scholar, I engage with multiple spaces crossing over, as Gloria and Sathua describes, because I, in my CISA, continually walk out of one culture and into another, because I am in all cultures at the same time. The boundaries of my Nepantla consist of Aslan and the river's edge, which serve as geographical markers of Los Angeles' cultural corridor, a space that continually disavows the Chicano, Mexican-American, or Latino presence in the area. The cultural corridor connects Little Tokyo, Art, Little Tokyo, the Historic Arts District, Civic Center, Grand Avenue, and accounts more for the investment interests of Neo Boosters and the mayor's agenda than it does the cultural ventures in the area. The residents and participants benefit from the programming developed at each of the major uh, art and cultural venues. Few address those who are caught in this Nepantla. My interest in situating Aslan and the River's Edge and the LA Cultural Corridor is to address the fluid movement of bodies that inhabit this space and the dynamism that occurs when these bodies enact that space in order to understand how cultural policies have defined the cultural landscape and creative endeavors from 1965 to the present. Today I share an excerpt of my work and discuss the case study of the Japanese American National Museum, JANO, how it helped revitalize Little Tokyo and created models of community rebuilding via cultural activity as a means of self-realization and communal rediscovery. Given the symposium's theme, I hope to underscore a dialectical relation between art and place and hopes to demystify perceptions that LA has no cultural center. Mm -hmm. A discussion of space and place is necessary since locations are perceived as enduring repositories of identity and emotions. With this in mind, I cite Kevin Starr to frame my presentation uh, in relationship to the emergence of Janum within the LA downtown area. Los Angeles did not just happen or arise like so many other American cities out of the existing circumstances. Los Angeles envisioned itself, then externalized that vision through sheer force of will, springing from a platonic conception of self, the great Gatsby of American cities. <laughs> Starr speaks to how boosterism promoted the region by highlighting the quality of life to its local constituents and the nation, and the opportunities to make one's mark in this imagined, pristine landscape. Since the city's founding, Los Angeles' boosters jockeyed politicians to create a cultured city in the same vein as New York. Though early boosters like Harrison Gray Otis and Harry Chandler did have a stronghold on the city's political arena, much of the city's cultural vision had yet to be realized. In the 1960s, the city emerged out of its cultural provincialism with the building of two key art institutions, the Music Center in 1964 and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 1965. And in this image, you see also Disney Hall there, uh, which came about in this, in this century. While each side had, had their own sort of beginnings and challenges, and challenges to stay afloat, a common factor to their establishment was the financial backing from influential supporters in the arts among Los Angeles boosters. Sarah Schrank's study, Art in the City, mediates a discussion of class and, and culture operating hand in hand, exposing a systematic erasure of other cultural endeavors already existing in the area cultural endeavors that may be considered folk or ethnic. To illustrate this erasure, I include here Mike Davis's Archipelago, published in the seminal text, City of Courts. In Davis's mapping of prominent institutions in the area, he omits the cultural spaces which are pivotal, pivotal in the sustainability of neighborhoods, including, but not limited to, cell phone graphics, Plaza La Raza, St. Elmo Village, Watts, Arts, Watts Towers Art Center. Um, visual communications beyond Baroque and Spark. And as a side note, many of the artists were already collaborating between these institutions since the 1970s, but that's a story yet to be written, so if anyone wants to collaborate, let's do it. Uh, George Lipsch's concept of the poetics of place provides a framework to analyze the interconnectedness of place and cultural production, operating as a prism by which to view the dynamics of art that emanate from economically and socially deprived regions. Attuned to the spatial, historical, and sociological factors that contributed to a region's depletion of economic resources, Lipschitz calls for a criticism that understands and analyzes the conditions of production. 
His aim is not to introduce another theory for interpreting culture, as he says, rather to elucidate, quote, a better theorized understanding of social relations by under understanding the interplay of art, culture, and commerce within them. My interest in the poetics of place is the possibility to formulate an epistemology about the interconnectedness of place and culture and examine the dynamics and operation of people who claim a stake in that place in a city like Los Angeles. Given that Los Angeles has been configured as a malleable product whose image benefited the booster industries of real estate, tourism, and revitalization projects, a consequence of selling LA manifested in acts of regional ethnic cleansing. By pushing out residents of color from working class communities in the downtown area, all in the name of progress. The discursive power inherent in the proliferation of boosterism served to market an Anglo Angelino past that disavows Mexicans. Raul Villa's study by Logos examines the methods practiced by downtown developers to cleanse the city and how the hegemonic structure facilitated these practices with monies provided by urban renewal projects introduced by the Federal Housing Act of 1949 and the Defense Act of 1956. In light of these discussions of blighted communities, boosterism, and the poetics of place, I investigate how the establishment of, the, of JANA in Little Tokyo served the city's interests. The opportunity to solicit foreign investment facilitated the transformation of a once blighted neighborhood and reaffirmed the city's commitment to the arts. I discussed JANA's programming, particularly the Boyle Heights Project, The Power of Place exhibition, a thematic show representative of the city's multicultural demographics how it served to build communities through the community's proactive approach of seeking stories and artifacts, artifacts from within Boyle Heights. Foregrounding Janum's location and, time, and at times in the shadow of City Hall, an analysis of the institution's history and explorations of community partnerships supports the premise that Janum's programming benefited from redevelopment projects of the downtown area and as a consequence aided in the city's cultural capital with the addition of a national museum in the cultural corridor. Upon seeing the exhibition, Japanese American Soldier at the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History, businessmen as well as veterans began to dream of a museum that would tell their story. First plans to build a museum were led by Bruce T. Kaji, a businessman involved with the Little Tokyo Commerce Association, who wanted to include a museum in one of the residential complexes being built in Little Tokyo. The veterans had, who had sponsored an exhibition about the 101st and the 442nd Infantries were looking for a permanent home to house their show. Korean American Colonel Young Oak Kim and Japanese American YB Mamiya approached Kaji and together explored options with the city and California legislature to open a museum. Thus, in 1985, JANM officially incorporated. Now, part of what's happening in this redevelopment, they also solicit funding from the CRA, which is a community redevelopment agency, and so the CRA was already invested in this area south of, um, south of Los Angeles. Um, and part of this redevelopment included the restoration of iconic structures like the Nishi, Hongwanji Buddhist Temple, uh, which was actually owned by the city but managed by the CRA. And so they secured a lease of a dollar a year for this space. The temple constructed in 1925 the temple constructed in 1925 served as a community gathering place, as well as housed personal belongings of people interned in the camps. Since the building had been in disrepair and was scheduled for demolition, Janum raised $10.2 million to repair and restore the historic structure. And due to the 1990 Northridge earthquake, it further delayed plans for the opening because the structure needed to be retrofitted. In 1992, Janum opened its doors at the renovated temple, presenting exhibitions there until 1999. However, without the participation of community members, key individuals working nationally and a volunteer uh, corps, all striving towards the common goal of opening the museum, it could not have sustained expansion efforts. Some successful initiatives included the designation of the entire block uh, as a national historic landmark in 1995. And when this happened, it helped Jan submit their proposal to the CRA to then build the expansion of the pavilion, which is the structure we see today, an 85,000 square foot building um, that currently houses their permanent exhibition common ground and all their uh, current uh, uh, temporary exhibitions. Jam's vision aims to, quote, transform lives and strengthen community through the exploration of diverse histories, arts, and cultures, end quote. 
And through its public programs and collections, Jadam invites audiences to consider the complexities of an American experience through a Japanese American perspective, and quote, promotes understanding and appreciation for the ethnic diversity, end quote. Um, I'm going to jump forward. Uh, part of what happens then when Janum is trying to open at the temple, um, it coincides with, uh, with the LA riots. Uh, so they couldn't have their opening as scheduled on April 30th, 1992. And I speculate that this is what challenged the museum to really rethink its mission. Los Angeles was burning again because the city's denizens were up in arms about the court's decision to acquit four LA police officers in the case of Rodney King. Then Governor Pete Wilson deployed the National Guard, as you see here in this image, to assist the LAPD in the areas affected by the looting and rioting on April 29, 1992, and the city was forever changed. So opening 10 days later, Janus soon developed educational programs that, quote, promoted human understanding, end quote, meaning its call to be a conscious dialogical space. Uh, and part of this was then developing a program called the National Partnership Program, where they acknowledge the importance of community input and actively engage communities to define and interpret their own experiences. So this question of agency that's been coming up today, this was one way that I think Adam Janum uh, presents that. Uh, and the success of the National Partnership Program allowed it to, allowed it to uh, then create different exhibition models. And the one that I will focus on today is Boyle Heights. Firmly rooted in a sense of place, the Boyle Huts project aimed to catalyze a broad range of participants to extend themselves across borders of various making. This is part of uh, Sojen Kim, the, the program director's uh, reflection on this. Quote, including the physical barriers of the LA River, the socially politically constructed divides of race and ethnicity, the gaps separating generational experiences, and the different positions from which academic histories and public memory are generated. So from the planning stages, the project was intended to be a multi-ethnic and collaborative approach to documenting a Los Angeles neighborhood. And so how they did this was having collection days and conducting research. Um, and part of the community project uh, was also supported by, by several institutions in Boyle Heights. Um, in several of the grant proposals, though, Molly Wilson Murphy's story illustrated best the premise of the project. The biggest day for the Boyle Heights project was a great success given the enthusiastic interest by alumni at Roosevelt High School, uh, particularly the class of 1944, in which one of their uh, members, Bud Weber, mailed letters inviting classmates to bring their personal artifacts, memorabilia, and photographs for this event. His letter included a treatise on growing up in Boyle Heights and began with, who would say yes, I was born in Weir and or once lived in Boyle Heights. Janum organized three collection days at Roosevelt High School to share those memories. And so what I include here is an excerpt of her letter to uh, Bud Weber. So the story goes that she arrives with two grocery bags full of letters and photographs and just starts sharing her, her own experience. Um, her collection provides insights on growing up as a teenager during the height of World War II, and her friends, despite the political climate, managed to share their dreams and aspirations with one another. I highlight Molly Wilson's response to Mr. Weber to elucidate perceptions of who were considered members of this multicultural community in East LA, exemplifying how neighbors interact with one another despite language barriers. From the beginning stages of the Boyle Heights project, Janum understood that the collaborative nature with a cross-section of institutions and scholars would, quote, inform subsequent research and provoke new discussions about the infinity complex and powerful dynamics of local community life in Los Angeles, end quote. Mrs. Wilson's personal archive embodies the conviviality of the neighborhood and the importance of archival research with living histories. However, Janet's challenge was to alter perceptions of Boyle Heights being mostly an immigrant community or solely Mexican-American. By focusing on just the immigrant experience, the exhibition and project would subsume stories of those natives to the region. Highlighting only a Mexican-American Chicano experience would disavow the other communities, including Japanese-Americans and the Nikkei in the area. So how to balance the immigrant and the Japanese-American experiences that manifested east of the LA River? Janin did this in several ways. So this is um, one way that they did this was actually having the glassine envelopes uh, put along the wall. Uh, they also acquired several artifacts from these collection days and are now housed at Janum as part of their collections. 
Um, and so part of, I highlight here that the glassine envelopes, because the intent was that people could bring non-organic um, materials, ephemera, and add it to the exhibition, so it's kind of this ongoing story. However, because, as you notice, the placement, some are too high. And if you can, you know, we all know that we can't touch the walls, so <laughs> it kind of proved a little bit challenging. So then it really served as a metaphor of this kind of open-endedness and ongoing story of this history of Boyle Heights. But given that the exhibition highlighted the period from 1920 to 1960, prior to the advent of the Chicano movement, the involvement of Boyle Heights residents in the movimiento is not included in the show. Nevertheless, the exhibition opened with much excitement and support from Boyle Heights residents, as was on view from September 2002 to February 2003. The gallery spaces were activated with new contributions from museum visitors and community advisors serves as gallery guides. The 14 public programs offered more opportunities to add to the story of Boyle Heights through a series of mappings. So I'm just going to show you some gallery shots here. The Boyle Heights project followed the model museum's national partnership program of working with various community partners, and their voice is at the forefront of the exhibitions. The selling point to funding organizations was that the project was that the project presented the history of Los Angeles's first multicultural neighborhood and subsequent changes in the neighborhood through multiple perspectives for residents who lived in the area. And I'm actually going to end here with um, something about the museum. Through the Boyle Heights project, Jana negotiated the fissures, fissures and expectations of the Japanese American constituency, and in so doing, also produced a Chicano exhibition, an LA show. The project serves as a model of the types of exhibitions that should be produced at any museum in Los Angeles or metropolis that is as diverse. The Boyle Heights project reflects the museum's commitment to, quote, build bridges among ethnic and cultural groups for the future, end quote. And Irene Herano, Janum CEO and President, would further reflect that the gathering of personal stories would put the National Museum as an institution that, quote, embodies an intensely personal experience of historical events, end quote. And this is the challenge for future curators who want to produce exhibitions that present comparative multicultural experiences. At what points do our collective stories, experiences intersect? And, the, and where are the points of departure that reveal LA stories, not solely from a monocultural point of view, but that act, but by those who actively, uh, but, but by those who activate the space and places. Thank you.